It reminds me of some of the really first days that I think even the Hex family were some of the only ones that are still kind of around from the days when we used to, when we started this church in my living room. And uh, for the first kind of six months of kind of exploring what it would be like to start a church, we, we did a kind of a Saturday night and sometimes Sunday night Bible study in, in our home. And, and the draw was not so much the Bible study, but the fact that Pam cooked every night. And so people would come, and we had a great time. And what I loved about that season is, is that um, we had a lot of people who didn't go to church at all. And so some, many have moved away and uh, gone to do other things. But, but we had a good portion of people that would come to that little home group we did. In fact, over half that weren't connected to a local church, weren't even Christians at the time, and still trying to work through what faith would mean for them. And so what would happen in our home for, before we became this is we would kind of have a Bible study. I would lead the adults through a study, and Pam would take the kids to our basement and teach a little time for the kids. And during one of those times, we were working our way through prayer and kind of trying to teach these these new Christians and the, or exploring Christians, what, what prayer was all about. And so down, down there, I remember this, cause, and I wasn't there because Pam was, Pam was doing this, but we had a little girl who was probably second or third grade. And Pam is teaching all about prayer. She's walking through the Lord's Prayer. Here are all the things we can pray to God about. Here's how we can pray. Here's, here's when we can pray. Here's the things we should pray. And she's, she's teaching all these kids. And, and you can see this two or third, the second or third grade girl getting all kind of worked up. Like, like, and she goes, hold on. Hold up. Are you telling me that we can talk to God? Like, is that a thing that if I just think or talk, God hears me. And Pam's like, uh, yeah, that's prayer. God hears you. I mean, she probably didn't say it that sarcastic because she's nicer than me. But, um, but that's, but it was like, yeah, you can, you, you can talk to God all the time. God can hear what you're thinking in your head. God can hear what you're saying out loud. You can talk to God. And she goes, like my, you know, the mind blown, mind blown. And I thought about that story, particularly as we look to the book of Ephesians today, because the passage we're looking at is all about a prayer that Paul does. It's about a prayer that Paul writes out for us to show us and teach us how he is praying for the for the Ephesians. And, I, and that story about that little girl in our basement reminds us that when it comes to prayer as a believer in Jesus Christ, oftentimes it is really easy, whether you have grown up in church your whole life or whether you're brand new to the ideas of Christianity and just exploring what it would mean to follow Jesus Christ. The idea of prayer is easily forgotten. The weightiness of the privilege of prayer is easily forgotten. And at the same time, that story reminds us that we got to teach each other how to pray. That prayer is something that is taught. And many of us might feel like we don't know how to pray. We've never been taught how to pray. And I've met very few Christians that feel like they've got their prayer life figured out. I've met some. And man, when they pray, it's like Jesus is in the room and it's amazing. But for the, for the most of us, including myself, I feel like prayer is one of those elusive, always on the peripheral, trying to get better, trying to be more consistent, trying to get more intimacy with Christ. Prayer is one of those things that we're, we're always trying to lean into, but not always realizing the weight and the privilege and the blessing of prayer that we can actually talk to God. That's a thing. And so I think there's a couple reasons why, why prayer is sometimes a struggle. One of them is it's just not often modeled well. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we treat prayer like something very private. We hold it very close. Like this is between God and me. This is, my, I go to my prayer closet, if you will. I, I, want, I don't want to, and some of this is often like built out of humility, right? We don't want to be like, in front of our neighbors, when, oh God, hear my prayers for my sinful neighbors. Pray that they pick up their dog stuff. And that's, sorry, I don't know where that came from. Pray that they mow their lawn this week. So you're not, you're not making it like a, this big, this big ordinate thing. But we hold prayer very privately. I knew one lady that said, I'll never pray out loud because that's between me and God, not you. 
Okay, moving on then. So, so sometimes, you know, let me put this on the screen. Sometimes we make prayer so private that we never help others discover what prayer is like for themselves. We hold prayer so personal that we don't model it as we disciple and lead others. But another reason is simply that we just don't teach on it. Maybe it's out of guilt for not doing it well. Maybe it's because we're busy doing other things. But oftentimes when it comes to prayer, we don't make it a part of our discipleship process. It's like you pray a second for meals. You pray before church service, but kind of a quick like, dear God, help us not, to help us to be here. Thank you. Amen. Move on. Or like, or you just, you don't teach it. You just kind of make it more intuitive. And I would actually argue that a failure in a church to be a praying people can be traced back to the failure in the church to be teaching about prayer. Like we bemoan the fact that we don't pray, but we don't often teach prayer well. And so that little girl in my basement reminded me this week, we can actually talk to God, but we need to learn how to do it ourselves. We need to learn more deeply how to pray and how to be people of prayer. And that's where we get to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul ends really this, this section of the book from verse 14 through verse 21 is a prayer that he models and he writes out and he teaches us what prayer looks like. He teaches us how to pray as he kind of wraps up this current section of the book. And so for us, this is a way that we can see what to pray, how to pray, what prayer looks like. It's modeled for us and it teaches us, I think, some keys to a powerful prayer life. Some keys to what it means to pray well. And so let me read this prayer to you. And then let's talk about it some more. Here's the prayer. Now this reason, or for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner being through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love. And to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do more and or above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That's a prayer. And let's talk, let's, let, me, let me pray now, and let's talk about it. God, we are like that girl. We may know that we can talk to you, but Lord, I'm sure many of us here today have not embraced the gift of prayer like we need to, myself included, to be people of prayer to be hungry to pray, to be, to be dependent on you through prayer, God. Help us to see the power of prayer, the need for prayer, the joy of prayer, the way you work through prayer. And God, if we're confused at how to pray, God, give us people in our lives that'll teach us and let us see from this passage the way Paul himself models and teaches us about prayer. And so God, teach us the, the power of prayer, the focus of prayer, and the posture we have as we come into prayer before you, God. But make us a people who are a praying people, dependent on you, needing you to move, so that way we don't rely on our strength, but we rely on your strength. That we don't rely on our resources and powers and our personalities, whatever it might be, but God help us to turn through prayer that over to you. It's in all these things, Lord, we turn to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So I think from this passage, what we'll see here is we will see four Four keys to a powerful prayer life. Four keys to a powerful prayer life. And I, I think they just kind of show us some highlight focuses of the way Paul prays and the way that he is um, working through this prayer. So the first one is this. To kind of go back to the top of the passage, the first key to a powerful prayer life is to make sure in our lives that we are coming to God with genuine humility. The first key here that we see is that we want to come to God 
with a sense of real humbleness and dependency and need before God. And that you see a posture here of prayer. So, so verse 14 and 15. As Paul begins his prayer, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now I, I love that picture. Now if you were with us a couple weeks ago when we read and did the, the first part of chapter 3, you'll remember that that Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 starts out with the phrase, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, and then he kind of went on this rabbit trail about his calling, about the gospel mystery, about what it means to know Christ today. Now Paul is basically coming back around to the prayer he was going to say. So he, he, we, we finished the rabbit trail. We did our Halloween focus last week on fears. And then we're back now with Paul saying, for this reason. We're back on his train of thought. We're back to his prayer. And the phrase, for this reason, it connects the dots between everything we've talked about and what he's about to pray. So the spiritual blessings we've looked at in Ephesians chapter 1. The blessings of knowing Christ, of being in Christ, of being adopted and called and predestined and all those things about, about having an inheritance and being given the Spirit and all the blessings we have in Christ. For this reason, Paul prays. Or because of this, the grace that has saved us, we saw in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not a work that you do, but it's because of Christ. For this reason, he prays. Or how about in Ephesians chapter 2 when he looks at the picture of the church that Jews and Gentiles, Greeks and Jews, those who are eth ethnically from the heritage of God and Abraham and those who are, who are not come together into this new person, this new ethnically uh, together church from all over the world. For this reason, Paul is praying. So all these things link to the prayer he's about to do. For this reason, he's bowing to pray. And that's really what I want you to see here in verse 1 is the posture that he prays. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. You know, it's, it was, we often think about praying as kneeling. If you were to actually probably Google praying, you'd probably see pictures or images of somebody on their knees praying on the ground. But that was not the normal posture of prayer for a Jewish person. That the posture of prayer was always standing for the Jews. I mean, for the most part, they stood to pray. They, they lifted their hands and kind of opened themselves up to heaven. You get a picture of the wailing wall in Jerusalem. You go and stand by the wall to pray. Or Jesus himself, when he talked about prayer, he talked about standing to pray. In fact, he condemned the hypocrite Pharisees for standing in the wrong spots. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. Whenever you pray... He says you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and standing on the street corners to be seen by all the people. Truly I tell you, they have their reward. So the normal posture of prayer was not kneeling, it was standing. But throughout the Bible, there are special times of intensity and dependency where you kneel down to pray. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he, he did something out of characteristics for a king. He knelt down and prayed. In Acts chapter 9, when, when Peter prayed for Tabitha to be healed after falling to her death during a Bible study, he, he knelt beside her bed to pray. And so there was a, there's a special intensity. When you want God to move, you humble yourself and you kneel down. With, and it's a posture of humility. Psalm chapter 96, verses 6 and 7 says this. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. I love that picture. Let's worship. Let's bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, Lord our God, our make, maker. In fact, the word worship, it has, this, has the original, the, the, the combination of the words is, is to kiss the feet of somebody worthy. Like you, you worship somebody when you kind of like scoop down low and kiss the feet. It has, has a, some of the original orients of the word have this idea of getting down low. And so kneeling in prayer 
is an outward expression of an inward humility before God. It's, it's an outward picture of an inward disposition of humility, which means that you don't have to always kneel. Like we don't kneel often in our services. Sometimes we don't often kneel to pray here. I'll, I'll probably won't kneel to pray here in a minute. But, but it's an outward expression of what should be an inner heart before God that says, you're God, I'm not, and I'm humbling myself before you. The God who, as Paul says here in our passage, every family in heaven and on earth is named. When you are named by somebody, they own you. I named my kids. I named my goldfish. I named my dog. I named my car. When you name something, it's a sign of possession. Okay, Pam named our kids. And Pam named my car. And you get the idea, right? But God names every family on earth because he is our Lord, he is our master, he is our owner, he's our father, and so we bow humbly before him. You can't, you can't pray with arrogance. It doesn't work. And so Paul says he kneels to pray. This needs to be our posture. This needs to be our posture. I'm reminded of... Um, the fact that even in prayer, we can be prideful. Even in something that should be humbling, like, God, I need you. Would you work in my life? We can come to God in prayer with our pride intact. Just like those Pharisees standing on the street corners, standing in the synagogue, trying to get all eyes on them. But even still, we can come to God with, with our agenda, with our purposes, with our desires, with our intentions. And then, you know, say, God, bless my plans. God, work my way. God, make me happy. God, make me comfortable. And when he doesn't, we get grumpy. God, did you not hear me? I wanted that better job. I wanted that new car. I wanted my kids to get that good grade. What's wrong with you, God? That's praying with pride still intact. You know, I, one time when I was a pastor at another church, we, we did a building project and we kind of messed up. We kind of got, we kind of got misled and we ended up doing some work inside that, that kind of required a permit, might have required a permit. And of course, no one ever tells you that while you're working. It's when it's done. By the way, that job you just did kind of needed a permit and I'm, I'd hate for someone to call. Yeah, okay. And so... I ate some humble pie and I drove up to the, to the county office and said, um, we messed up. And so, you know, we messed up. We did this thing. We didn't know. What can we do? And of course, I went in with a posture of great humility. Like, I'm so sorry. What did we do? But let's be honest. My attitude was, this is stupid. Government's just out for our money. They just want their, they just want their permit fees. They're just keeping the inspectors. So like my outward expression was, was contrite, sorry. But my, in, my inward stuff was like, ugh, can't believe I have to do this. And don't you think sometimes that plays over into our prayer? Doesn't that play over into our worship sometimes? That same kind of idea that outward we were like, yes, God, bless this, help this. We're going through the outward motions. But inside... There's this pocket of, of pride, of arrogance, of selfish, I want it my way. I don't want to do it your way, God. So, so we, we come with anything but kneeling down before God. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Do you come to prayer looking to follow God's best plan? Or do you come to prayer looking to God to sanctify your personal plans? Like, do you pray to God looking for him to, to, to kind of put a stamp of approval on what you want? Or are you coming to God seeking his heart for what he wants? The person who has knelt before God, whether it's outwardly or inwardly, the disposition of humility focus us on God. And you will get, you and I will get far more. We will find humble submission far better than arrogant expectation. And so let's, if you see this in your heart, and I see it in mine, let's come to God with this posture of prayer. Now here's the second key. The first key is come to God with humility. 
The second key is come to God desperate for his strength. You see a longing and a desperation for the strength of God in this passage. Verse 16, here, here's what it says. He kind of begins to throw some requests out there. And by the way, before I read that verse, I think this is important. He gets his heart right, and then he begins to ask God for the things that he knows we need. Now, this is not necessarily material things. These are spiritual requests, but, but here in verse 16, he says, I pray that he, God, may grant you according to the riches of his glory. That's a big ask. That's a big pool to pull from. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So let's stop there for a second. Paul begins by praying and he asks for two things. He's asking that they would be strengthened and he's asking that they would know God's love. And so those are the two big requests he's about to make. And we're going to look at love next. But let's talk about the, the request for strength here, that he asked for strengths. And I love this because the picture of strength and the picture of love is not just that they would intellectually know these things, but he's praying that they would experience these things. And so he's, he's asking God in prayer that this church, the, the Ephesian church, would not just intellectually have an understanding of the strength of God, and not just intellectually have a theological treatise on the love of God. He's asking that they experience it in their lives. That in their souls, in their relationships, in their prayer life, in the way they go about their day, that they would just not know what they would experience. The strength of God and the love of God in their lives. And so this reminds me here of something really important to make, a, to make note. The goal of our maturity, the goal of gospel maturity, is not just to know truth about God, but to experience it in our lives. It's not just to be able to answer questions on a theological test, but to be able to live it out in the everyday practice of our lives. And so that requires both knowledge and experience. Both knowledge and, and it working through in application. And so Paul's praying that they would know this. Biblical teaching should never stop with teaching. It should lead over to living. You don't just open your Bible to learn stuff. You open your Bible to live this stuff. And so Paul is praying that they would know this strength, that they would live this strength and experience this strength. And I think prayer, prayer is the engine by which we move or travel from faith ideas to faith experience. I think prayer is how we move from knowing ideas about God to living out the truths of God. I was, I was working with a church planning couple in, New, in Staten Island this week. They're, they're planning in Greensboro, but they encouraged me so much because we were talking about their spiritual life and just how, how God's been growing, how God's been helping them, what are some ways that they've been deepening their faith. And they said, the greatest practice that we've done in the last two years is learning to pray Scripture. Like they'll read scripture and they'll pray it back to God. And they go, that's, that's changed our souls. And I love that because that's exactly what's happening here. Paul has taught this truth about God's blessing, about the spiritual blessing we have in Christ. And now he's praying it for his people. And so prayer is the engine by which we can connect ideas of faith to the experience of faith. And so here we go. That's a little rabbit trail, but Paul does it. I can do it. Here's what he says about strength. Verse 16, let's kind of loop back. He asked this church, he asked God that they may be strengthened with power in their inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul asks that this church would be strengthened. And the word strength has to do with, with capable, strong, mighty. They would, they would be strengthened. They would be strong. They would be capable. And he gives us two ways this happens. It happens in our inner being through the Spirit. And it happens through the indwelling of Christ in our lives. He says that you may be strengthened with power in your inner being. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
I love, I love that picture of dwell. I love that word dwell because it has this idea of long-term residence that Christ, as he strengthens us, takes up long-term residence in our souls. So we have the spirit in us. We have Christ dwelling in us. I think about it as the difference between a hotel and a home. I'm flying out to Detroit this, uh, this evening to do a, another church, kind of a weird, kind of double duty, if you will, but it doesn't happen all often or at all, but here we are. So I'm flying to Detroit this evening. I'll be staying in a hotel for three nights and then flying back on Wednesday. And um, when I get to that hotel, I'm not going to really settle in because I'm going to be there for three days. I, I might like, if the, if the chair needs to be moved a little bit, I'll move the chair. But like, I'm not going to be like, hanging up new paintings and ripping down wallpaper and, you know, the hotel doesn't take kindly to those sorts of things. I'm not going to be rearranging the bed and trying to push it over because I'm just borrowing that place for a couple of days. But in my home, I mean, we're, right now we're pit, picking out new paint colors. We're, we're thinking about laying new flooring down. Pam, I know Pam's going to go to Lowe's while I'm gone and do all some, some stuff for us. Like, you make your home a place you dwell in. You begin to kind of craft it after your desires. And that's what it means here. Christ is not taking up hotel, you know, Hilton reward points on your life. Christ is making a home in your life, which means he is transforming your fixer-upper, okay, into something that is sanctified and looks more like Jesus. Christ dwells, and through that, there is strength. That's why Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 says, I, I am able, or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That when Christ is in you, when the Holy Spirit is in your inner dwelling being, if you will, you are strengthened. And the question is, are you experiencing that? We know that, but are you living that in the confrontations of your life, in the hardships of your life, in the difficult moments of your life? Do you know and experience that inner strength from Christ? Now what is interesting is this is completely opposite of how the world looks at strength. This is completely flipped and countercultural to way, the way we normally think about who is strong, who is able, who is mighty. Because when we think about strength, oftentimes we're wired to look at the outside. We're wired to look at what our eyes see. And so when somebody is strong, they, they have a strong personality. You know, they're they're, they're bold and brash and convicted. They're strong personality. You see that. Charismatic. When somebody is, is strong physically, you can look at their muscles and they're bulging and, and, they're, and you go, man, you could break me in half. We've got a guy on what, Kalen's soccer team, one of the dads, and I, and I watch him walk. And it's, I mean, the dude's a tank. Maybe Bigger. And I'm and just like, I don't even, I hope I can outrun you because that's all I got if we get in a fight is, out, is, my, is my ability to run. And I'm not all that fast. But you look at him and go, that dude is in the gym. Like, that dude is strong. Or you look at their bank accounts or their skills. Like, right, like, oh man, you're strong. You can do all these things. You got all these resources. But the tr truth is God flips the script. What makes you really strong is not what's on the outside, not your muscles, not, not your bank account, but what makes you strong is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and, and the dwelling of Christ in your hearts. That's what makes you strong. It's God's at work in you. And we see this in Scripture, by the way, a couple places, particularly in the Old Testament. We see in, when, when God picked out King Saul, uh, or I'm sorry, when God kicked out King David to replace King Saul, David was like the runt of the pack, okay? He was like, the, he, he was so underrated that David's father didn't even line him up with his brothers. Like, oh, the little runt, David, you want, you want him? And so 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7 says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or stature because I've rejected him. Speaking of Saul. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. See, God looked at Saul and said, he's big, he's strong, but I've rejected him, and I want the little David guy. He's going to be the king, because God does not look like we look. He looks to the heart.
And then verse, uh, verse Psalm chapter 31, Proverbs rather, 31 verse 30. This is the verse that actually is talking about women and the, 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 um, the righteous woman passage, if you will. He says this, Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. It's not the outside, it's what's here. It's what, it's what God is doing on the inside. And so, so lasting strength is not found in our fitness, our fortune, or our fashion, or all those things that we can, we can continue to find words to fill up, but it's found in our faith. And Paul prays this for this church, that they would know strength. And I'm praying this for you guys, that when you go to work tomorrow, your strength is not in your position, your strength is not in your skill sets, your strength is not in how, how fast you walk, how healthy you are, but your strength is in Christ. And our strength as a church is not our budget, not our locations, not our, not our, our stuff we've got, but our strength is in Christ. That should be our prayer. Now the third point is I got to get moving is that we need to come to God exploring his love. One of the cool things about prayer, the gifts of prayer, is not, not only can we ask to be strengthened and ask for others to be strengthened, but we can come to God diving deeply into the, the well and the richness of his love. Verse uh, 17 and 19 says this. I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length, the height, or the width, the height, and the depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. He's praying that they would dig into the love of God, that they would know the depth and height and width and length and all these things about the love of God. He's praying that in prayer and through prayer and in their lives, they would experience that love that is bigger and beyond knowledge. And I, I think it's interesting to note how he says this is the kind of, this love is something we establish ourselves in. I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love. That the Christian, because of God's love, is founded in love, is established in love. And I was thinking about all the values of companies and businesses. Like I read, I read a lot of leadership books and podcasts and things trying to just lead this church well and leave myself and family well. And, and they always talk about value-driven leadership. Like values that drive your organization. Drive values that are foundational to who you are. And so like, what would Chick-fil-A be without my pleasure? Right? Like Chick-fil-A goes away. Becomes McDonald's with chicken without customer service. They are built on loving the customer and, you know, saying my pleasure. That's just, it's their pleasure to do all the crazy things we ask them as customers. Or, or what, would, what would Apple be not Applebee's, what would the company Apple become without the innovation that drives their company, without trying to be the best and the newest and all these sorts of things? What would Instacart be without the value of convenience? And so like all these businesses are, have, have these values that they're established on. And I know the church is not a value, Christianity is not a business, but if you want to think about it that way, the church is not the church without the foundation of love. It's our value. And so he prays that you would be rooted and established and whatever else might want to unite us, it would fall secondary to the love we have first for God and then for one another. And so if you want a great prayer for the church, pray that we love one another well. Pray that all the other false foundations that creep in would go away and we would love one another well. That we would do that faithfully to God and his word. And the fact is this, I love this quote from John Stott. True knowledge of God is unattainable without love. You will never know God fully until you know love from God. And I love the challenge too. I'm saying I love a lot, but you get this. I like this passage, I guess. I like how he challenges them that you would know with all the saints together what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love. Now the truth is you'll never know that. That's like a challenge that you can't win. It's an exploration that you'll never run out of because when it comes to God's love, you can't measure it. Like there's no yardstick 
long enough to measure the love of God, to see the love of God, to get a picture of the length and width and depth and height. It's impossible because God's love is endless. Other passages talk about this. In fact, I'll show you a couple. Jeremiah 31.3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You know what that means? Doesn't have an expiration date. I've loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued to extend faithful love to you. God's love is everlasting. Or Psalm chapter 103, verses 11 through 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions from us. It's a picture of God's love. As high as the heavens. Which means you can keep going and we'll have eternity to explore the love of God and never run out. You know, I think about whenever I move into a home, we've moved now three times, we've bought three homes and we love our home and hope to not leave it. Um, you have that little season of exploring your new home, right? Like, oh, I didn't know this closet was here. Or, oh, there's a shed in the backyard. Or, oh, this is an interesting little cubby space I didn't see before. And so oftentimes, depending on the side of the home, you can explore the whole home in an hour. You know, a bigger home might take you a couple days to kind of get to all the closets and bathrooms and weird things about a home. Your mansions might take you months, right? You're like, oh, here's a new bathroom I've not seen. And so eventually you will run out of places to explore. But God's love, you will never run out of ways to explore the love of God. And we can do that together. We can do that together. Now let me, let me encourage you to look to know God's love. And to know God's love, we have to be in prayer. The way you grow in a loving relationship in marriage or families is to talk to one another. The way you explore love is to spend time with one another, to do things with one another, to be, be re in relationship with one another. And so how can you know God's love if you're not in relationship with God, if you're not talking with him, if you're not reading his word, if you're not, if you're not going and doing things, if you're not leaning into him, if you're not experiencing life with him? That's how you learn and know God's love. And it takes place through the engine of prayer that connects those faith ideas with that faith experience, knowing God's love. You know, here's the last point. The last point. We need to come to God in prayer with great expectation. We need to come to God in prayer with great expectation. When we pray, we have to believe and know that God can do a whole lot more than even we imagine. Now, this, this passage is one of my favorite in the New Testament because it drives me what I do in this church, what I do in my own faith walk, because it reminds me that, that God can do more than even I dream up. Verse 20 says this, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now to him who can do above and beyond what we imagine to him be glory in the church forever and ever. And I, I, this is a doxology. It's a praise moment saying that God's power has no limits, including the limit of you, including your limitations. God's power has no limits, including our own barrier, beyond our imagination. All right, I gotta, I gotta talk about Star Wars for a second. One of my favorite scenes, I know you all laugh because you know me. One of my favorite scenes in Star Wars, which is not true, but one of, one, of the, one of the scenes I remembered this, one of the funny scenes in Star Wars, first movie, A New Hope, Han Solo, everybody's bad boy smuggler. They're trying to convince Han Solo to like save the princess and, and do all the good guy things. And you know, he's a smuggler, so he's kind of like, what's in it for me? And so during this conversation, they're saying, he'll, they'll, they're kind of trying to get him to serve and he'll go, you'll be rich. And he goes, how rich? He goes, how much money? And he goes, or she goes, more than you could possibly imagine. And he says, I can imagine a lot. Doesn't that remind you of this passage? I can imagine a lot that God can do. And God can do more than that. I can imagine a lot of things. But God can go above and beyond that. 
God is not limited by my imagination to bring about his glory. And so, so you, we can come to God asking for big things, asking for God to move, asking for God's will to be done. And so whether it's this church, whether it's a ministry, whether it's a hardened person in your life, whether it's a spiritual battle, a chain you're hoping to break, the gospel going forward in the community, God can do more than what we think is reasonable. And what I'm trying to get you to see, what I'm trying to get me to see is that we don't need a reasonable faith. We don't need to look to God and go, that's reasonable, that's not. That's logical, that's not. Because God doesn't have those categories. God doesn't have limitations. God doesn't have a prayer credit score that you, you qualify, you don't. God can do more than we imagine. And so we need to pray like that. We need to live like that. We need to trust like that. We need to expect this in our lives. And so I'm saying that to encourage me. And, and here's a convicting thing. How many of you woke up this morning thinking church would be just a normal day? Where is the expectation that God can change a life? That God can show up and move? That God could see marriages restored, that God could see addictions broken, that God could see eternities shaped and crafted. We need this expectation because we serve a God beyond our expectations. In fact, God can do more in response to one prayer than you and I can accomplish with a hundred years of our effort. God can do more in one prayer than a hundred years of labor on our own strength. And so let's be a praying church. Let's be a praying people. Let's be an expectation. People filled with expectation. Let's come to God with prayer. And so we need to be taught about prayer. That little girl in my basement taught us that you can actually talk to God. But isn't that a lesson you and I need today? In the busyness of our lives, do we forget to talk to God? Have we become functionally prayerless people? without expectation. Paul gives us a master degree in this humble posture, calling on strength, exploring love, and asking with big expectations.